Hi everyone, I hope you're all doing great. My plan today is to explain how to make some of the simulations of the heat equation and reaction diffusion equations that you find on this channel. Now I can imagine that many of you are more interested in simulating the wave equation and I plan to come to that in a later video, but the heat and reaction diffusion equations are a bit simpler to simulate, so it's a good starting point. So here's a first example of the type of equations we want to simulate. So it's the heat equation. To make things more interesting, I've chosen particular boundary conditions. So one boundary is given by this Mandelbrot set, which is at a hotter temperature. The other boundary is outside an elliptic domain, and it is set at a colder temperature. And you see here how heat diffuses from the hot Mandelbrot set to the colder ellipse. Here's another example that is now a reaction diffusion equation. It is called rock, paper, scissors, and it models a simple chemical reaction with three types of molecules. The concentrations here are shown in red, green, and blue, and you see this appearance of spirals. So let's start with a few properties of the heat equation. It was proposed by the French mathematician and physicist Joseph Fourier in 1822, and it describes the evolution in time of the temperature in a sample. So let's first look at a one-dimensional situation. So phi of Tx is the temperature at time t and at point x. And the idea is that if I discretize my one-dimensional sample, the temperature at point x will depend on the temperature a little bit to the left and to the right, so at point x minus delta x and x plus delta x, in the following way. So there's a heat flow from the right-hand box, which is proportional to the temperature difference here, and by using a Taylor's formula to first order, I can write this as the spatial derivative of phi at the middle point times delta x. I have a similar expression for the heat flow coming from the left box. There's a minus sign here because if the temperature is increasing, heat will flow out of the middle box and in the left box. Now if I add these two terms here, I get the net heat gain. Again, I see a derivative I mean, a difference appearing here, which can be approximated by a second derivative. So this is the heat equation resulting from this argument. So it says that the time variation of the temperature at time t and point x is proportional to the second spatial derivative of the temperature. There are a few situations where you can solve uh, this equation exactly, but let's look at an example first. So here I've started with an initial state where my sample is hot in the left half and cold in the right half. And you see that as time goes on, the temperature dis uh, distribution becomes smoother. So that's one important property of the heat equation. All right, so a first case where you can solve this equation is the one where you, we are on the whole real line, the infinite real line, and we give as an initial condition the temperature at every point. The first observation is that this equation is linear in phi, and therefore it satisfies the superposition principle, meaning that the sum of two solutions is again a solution. The second observation is that we have a whole family of particular solutions which are parameterized by a parameter y here. So if you know a bit of probability, what you will recognize here is the density of a normal or Gaussian random variable of mean y and variance 2t. You can check that it satisfies the heat equation just by plugging it in and 
using the Leibniz and chain rule to make the computation. One thing that you have to notice is that as t goes to zero, this becomes singular. Actually, it converges to what is called a Dirac distribution. But nevertheless, you can use this heat kernel to write as an integral the solution of the heat equation with initial condition phi naught. So it's given by the following integral and it satisfies the equation because the parameter y actually doesn't play any role when you plug it into this equation. So we just have to check the initial condition. So one way of doing that is to remember that in probability this type of integral is called the convolution of two distributions and it actually represents the density of a random variable given by the sum of two independent random variables with distribution phi naught and this heat kernel here. Now when t is equal to zero, uh, I have here a normal distribution with mean y and variance zero, so it's a random variable that has value y with probability one. And well, in that case, the convolution here just doesn't change phi naught. So phi of zero x will actually be phi naught of x as it should. Now, the infinite line is not really something we see a lot in real life. So here's another example where I want to solve the heat equation on an interval. So x now goes from 0 to L. And now I impose an addition boundary condition. So let's say the temperature at point 0 and at point L is equal to 0. I could use another value, it doesn't really matter, and it doesn't matter whether you use uh, temperature in uh, centigrade or Fahrenheit or Kelvin. We just impose the same temperature at both ends. Now, one technique to solve this equation is called separation of variables. It means that we make an ansatz, we plug in uh, phi of tx, which is a function of t, times a function of x. If I do that, I get the following equation. So first derivative of f times g is equal to f times second derivative of g. And assuming that f and g are not equal to zero, I can divide by f times g and I get the following equation. f prime over f is equal to g second over g. But since the left half is independent of, it's only a function of t, the second term is only a function of x, actually both have to be independent of t and x, and let me call this constant minus lambda. Now I have to solve two equations, but which are simple to solve, I know how to do that, so let's first deal with the g equation. So g second is minus lambda times g, if I take into account my boundary conditions, so g should be 0 and 0 and L, I find a family of solutions which are signs. They are signs with a frequency n pi over L, where n is any non-zero integer, positive integer. And then the, it satisfies this equation with lambda equal to n square pi square over L square. And given this lambda, I can also solve the equation for f, which is simply an exponential with some starting value. Now, this means that the general solution of my equation up here is given by a sum over all n of some parameter fn of 0 times an exponential times a sign. And fn of 0 has to be such that the initial condition is satisfied and so it gives you this condition here and the theory of Fourier series shows that you can indeed find fn 
for every n such that this uh, relation is satisfied. And then you have the solution of the equation. Now, one more mathematical property before we move to simulation. I've already said that the heat equation uh, has this property of making the temperature smoother as time goes on. So one way of seeing it is the following. So again, let me take the heat equation on the finite interval from 0 to L. And let me look at this integral here of the x derivative squared, which is called the Dirichlet energy. So it doesn't really have the meaning of an energy in physical terms, but it is called energy nevertheless because there are models which look similar, for instance in electrostatics, where indeed this quantity has the behavior of an energy. And let me compute the time derivative of this Dirichlet energy. So if everything is well defined, I can pull the time derivative inside the integral then I apply the chain rule, so I get dx phi times the time derivative of dx phi. And now I can do integration by parts. So what I did here is that I took the derivative of dx phi, I took the antiderivative of dt dx phi, that gives me just dt phi, and I have a boundary term but the boundary term is actually zero thanks to my boundary condition here. And because phi solves the heat equation, I can replace dt phi by the second derivative of phi in space. So I get actually minus the integral of the xx phi squared, which is negative or zero. And actually it is zero only if dx x phi is zero, so if phi is an, a fine function, which with my boundary conditions will actually be constant equal to zero. So what I've shown here is that the Dirichlet energy decreases unless phi is constant equal to zero. In other words, it means that the so phi tends to approach a constant function equal to, to zero, and in particular, uh, if I start with something that oscillates a lot, the oscillations are going to decrease in the, as time goes on. All right, so now uh, let's look at how we can solve this equation numerically. Of course, in dimension one, this is not really needed because we can we have all these analytic solutions, but this will be useful in higher dimension. So the method I'm going to use here is called discretization or finite differences. So what I do is I choose a small time interval delta t, a small space interval delta x, and I look at my equations at times given by n times delta t and positions given by i times delta x. So and let me call phi n i the value at phi at this time and this point. Now first let me do the time discretization. So the time derivative of phi can be approximated again by Taylor's formula by the difference between phi at time t plus delta t and phi at time t over delta t. So with my definition here, that's phi n plus 1 i minus phi n i over delta t. And this allows me to express phi n plus 1 i in terms of phi of n i and its time derivative. So this is known as the Euler scheme, and it is used very much in uh, solving differential equations. Now you may know that the Euler scheme is the simplest but not often not the best scheme because uh, it actually can give numerical instability. So there are improved schemes but the good news is that for the heat equation 
And that's actually thanks to this property of energy decrease that I just mentioned. For the heat equation, the Euler scheme is actually very stable. So you don't really need to worry about that. Now, the other thing we have to do is to discretize space. And this I've actually already done. So here I just repeat, it's the same computation as before, only now I start with the second derivative and I express it as some differences of quantities that are related to heat fluxes and which I can express again with my phi n and at points i plus 1, i and i minus 1. So the conclusion of all this, if I combine these two results, is that I get phi at point, so at time n plus 1 at point i, as being phi at time n point i, plus a certain constant, okay, which is related to my diffusion coefficient and uh, time interval and space interval, times this quantity here, which is called a discretized uh, second derivative. And this is, of course, only approximately equal. So you make an, uh, an error by doing that. But it turns out that if my time intervals and space interval are small enough, the error is not very important. Now, how do we do that now in two dimensions? Well, the idea is really the same. So I start, I look at my temperature at position x, y now, and it will uh, now depend on the temperature at four neighboring points in space. But the principle is exactly the same. And the result is that I now get the heat equation, which will feature two derivatives. So the second derivative in x, and the second derivative in y. And the sum of these two second derivatives is usually no denoted delta phi. And delta is called the Laplace operator or simply the Laplacian. Now, several things I've already told in one dimension still work in the same way here. So for instance, I still have a heat kernel, which is again a normal distribution only in higher dimension. However, uh, usually it's not so easy to solve the problem on a finite domain. If the domain has a simple form like a rectangle or a circle, I can do it. But in more general cases, uh, we don't always know how to solve the, uh, the equation, which would be Laplacian phi is equal to a constant times phi. However, uh, the discretization scheme works in pretty much the same way. So, okay, assuming that I take delta x equal to delta y, what I get is the following expression. So the only difference is that I have now my four neighbors, which appear here, and I have to subtract four times the value of phi in the middle. So, here is a variant of the simulation I showed at the beginning. One difference is that instead of showing uh, the temperature, I show the norm of the gradient of the temperature. So the colors here show how fast the temperature changes in space. So the red areas are areas where the temperature changes very quickly. And the other thing I've plotted here are these white curves, which are uh, actually going along the slope of the gradient. So they are steep descent curves. Now, there's uh, one reason why I have shown these curves here. That is because there's an analogy with electrostatics. So. We've seen before in dimension one that as time goes on, my solution of the heat equation will converge to uh, a solution of a second derivative phi equals zero. So in higher dimension, it will converge to what is called the Poisson equation. So Laplace phi equals zero. Uh, 
it turns out that this is also the solution of so uh, the equation satisfied by the electric potential with certain boundary values. So it means that if I charge the Mandelbrot set here at a different electrical potential than the outer ellipse here, what I get here are the field, field lines, the electric field lines. And you, need, you see this nice knife edge effect, which is that the electrical field lines tend to go to uh, places which, which are spikes of the Mandelbrot set. And this uh, actually gives an explanation of why lightning tends to strike uh, trees or tall buildings or antennas or features like that. So it's not that lightning magically finds uh, these places. It is that actually when uh, a thunderstorm builds, then uh, clouds uh, charge with a different charge than, uh, than the ground. And this instantaneously creates an electrical potential. It is almost instantaneous. So the electrical potential builds put, uh, more or less at the speed of light. And due to this knife edge effect, the electric field will be very strong uh, near uh, sharp uh, spikes like antennas and now air is a good insulator most of the time but when the electric field is really very strong it becomes uh, conducting and that is what happens when light lightning strikes and so lightning will tend to go along path where the electric field is very strong okay so now that we know how to simulate the heat equation, let's move on to reaction diffusion equations. So reaction diffusion equations uh, are good models for many natural phenomena, including chemical reactions and also uh, something called morphogenesis. So you probably all know about Alan Turing and he's mostly known for cracking the Enigma code during the Second World War and also for inventing Turing machines. But here is another important contribution of Alan Turing, which is this article, The Chemical Basis of Morphogenesis, that he wrote in 1952. So uh, the idea was to explain the appearance of patterns in uh, biology and, and other areas like uh, geometric patterns, uh, stripes and spots on uh, fur of certain animals. Or here is even another example where you see this for vegetation. So that is vegetation in Niger in a very dry area where there's not enough water for the vegetation everywhere. And uh, so you see that vegetation tends to accumulate in patches which has again a certain geometric structure like that. So the, the idea of Turing was that, you know, one uh, hypothesis was that, say, the spots on uh, the fur of, of a leopard are uh, somehow encoded in the animal's genes. But another uh, theory is that actually these patches appear in the fetus as it grows and it is somehow related to the fact that cells as they multiply uh, tend to specialize and for in particular when the fur is created at some point cells decide what kind of color they they will give to uh, to the hairs and so the idea is that maybe some hairs will decide to be become black and when doing that they uh, produce a certain chemical that will enhance or uh, uh, s uh, increase or decrease the uh, tendency of neighboring cells to get the same color. So if you have a sufficient number of black cells somewhere then uh, 
there, the probability that neighboring cells become black as well will decrease. And that is how the pattern is formed. So, in general, reaction diffusion equations uh, have the following form. So the time derivative of a certain quantity phi is given by, again, the Laplacian as for the heat equation. So that's the diffusion term. And what is new now is that I have a reaction term, which is a certain function, depending on the model, of the field. Now, uh, simulating this is a very easy extension of simulating the heat equation. So we already know how to simulate the heat equation part, the diffusion part. The only thing we have to do is to add this term here in delta t times f applied to phi. So let us look again at a few examples. So just a couple of tips when you really want to simulate this. So uh, one tip is that, okay, you are going to create a table or array with uh, these values phi, n, i, j, and iterate this relation here, which is actually very similar to a cellular automaton. Now, uh, when you have certain boundary conditions, like the Mandelbrot set or something else, you don't want to compute them at every step. So a good thing to do is to initialize once and for all a table telling you which of these points is inside the domain or on the boundary. And maybe if it's on the boundary, uh, you impose a certain value for the field. It could be zero, it could be something different. And, and this table you just keep. So then you go over all points. So i and j go from 0 to, uh, to some value n. And then you check whether the point is in the domain or not. And if it's in the domain, you apply this recursion. And if not, you just keep the same value. And the other tip is that to, to get a good result, it's a good thing to get uh, to take a rather small value of this delta t, but you don't need to, uh, you know, show one frame, compute one frame of uh, your movie for every time step. You can actually do many time steps in this iteration between frames. So in the simulation I do, the number of time steps can vary between five or ten or even several hundred or several thousand steps, depending on the equation. So here's a first uh, nice example of reaction diffusion equation. It's called the allen kahn equation. So the, the reaction term here has the form phi minus phi to the three. So this equation describes phenomena such as phase separation in an alloy, also the evolution of magnetization in a ferromagnet, where you have areas with positive and negative magnetization that tend to separate. It can at least approximately also describe what happens when you try to do a mayonnaise and it goes wrong in the sense that the oil and water uh, separate. Now, uh, one thing we can look at in this equation is what are the stationary solutions? So those for which dt phi is zero. So there are three particular uh, solutions which are easy to find, which are constant in space. So if phi is constant equal to zero, one or minus one, that is a solution because the Laplacian of that is zero and this term here will be zero as well. You can show that the zero solution is always unstable, but the one and minus one solutions are stable. Now, depending on the situation, depending on the shape of the boundary, you can have other non-constant solutions, which are, however, all unstable. So here's a simulation in dimension one. So you see here the values minus one and one. 
and the value zero in the middle, which is unstable. And one nice feature of this equation is that it tends to form domains in which phi is close to one or minus one. Between these domains, you have interfaces, but you see the interfaces tend to disappear as time moves on. So that is why we speak about phase separation. So we have these intervals where phi is close to minus one or one, but these intervals tend to, to grow and uh, the interfaces between them tend to disappear. However, the process slows down quite a lot. So the first interfaces disappear quickly and as time goes on, they disappear more and more slowly. So here's now another example in dimension two, where uh, I just write x instead of x, y. So x is now for the two components, x and y. And another difference here is that I actually increase the coefficient alpha in the course of time. This is to accelerate this phase separation process. So what you see here is again uh, an evolution where the interfaces become smaller and the areas in blue and, and red where the field is close to one or minus one uh, become larger and larger. And if you look uh, closely at the simulation, you can also observe that the interfaces move more quickly where their curvature is larger. So if you look at some small uh, patches like the round one here, you see that it is uh, shrinking and shrinking until it disappears completely. And so if we wait long enough, we should see all interfaces disappearing. By the way, there are periodic boundary conditions in this simulation. So the left-white boundaries are glued together as are the front and back uh, boundaries. All right, so that was the Alan Kahn equation. Now let's come to the rock, paper, scissors equation. So it describes the evolution in time of the density of three types of molecules. And let, let me call the densities U, V, and W. Okay, again, X stands for two-dimensional vector here. The total density is the sum of these three densities, u, v, and w. And the equations are the following. So now I have not one, but three fields, and each one has an evolution given by a diffusion, as in the heat equation, with a certain constant d. And in, uh, in addition, I have my three reaction terms. So what they say is, for instance, here for you, it says that uh, you have a faster reaction if you have more, uh, a larger qu quantity of U. Uh, but you have here uh, two terms, which so the speed of reaction decreases when the density increases, so when it approaches one. And it also, uh, so u tends to decrease uh, when there's a v present. So what happens here is that the second species, the v species, tends to uh, decrease the u species. And the w species decreases the v species and the u decreases the w. So you have this cyclic, uh, this cyclic setup here. So I've already shown a simulation at the beginning. Here is another one with a smaller spirals at the beginning and a, a different color code. Again, the viscosity increases as time goes on. And so you see these spirals appearing and the spirals tend to become larger and larger. Now, since there's only a limited space in the simulation, as spirals increase, some of them have, have to disappear. And if you look closely at the centers of the spirals here, you will see that actually some of them collide and disappear. Now I have another representation
here where I have tried to make the centers of the spirals more visible by doing some post-processing like taking the rotational of the field. So at the beginning it's not yet what very clear what ha what happens here but now you start okay you can see the centers of the spirals quite well and if you focus on some of these centers like here for instance you see that two of them get close to each other and they correspond to counter rotating spirals and when they get close enough they disappear so I don't actually know if there's a nice mathematical theory on how the centers of these spirals evolve, but it's certainly a nice uh, evolution to, to study. Now, there's a generalization of this rock-paper-scissors equation, which is called rock-paper-scissors-lizard-spock. So the name was created in a, an episode of the series Big Bang Theory. So now instead of three, I have five different states, so five different molecules, and each one of these five states beats two other states and is beaten by two states. So now I have five fields, so let me call them U, V, W, Y, and Z. The total density is the sum of all these, and here are my equations. So what you have to see here is that u is beaten by v and y, v is beaten by w and z, and so on. So I have a cyclic order here. And a and b are two coefficients which correspond to the pentagon and the pentagram you see in the, in the picture here. And I can choose A and B equal, or I can choose them different. So here's what happens when they are equal. So you see there are again spirals appearing, but now instead of three, I have five different colors. And one interesting thing you see here is that you could expect that uh, there will be five armed spirals appearing. But actually, if you look at the simulation, you see that at most points there are only three colors meeting. And you can see actually these three colors uh, correspond to triangles in the graph I've shown before. But another thing is that if you look at the simulation from a distance, you see that there are again larger areas appearing and in each of these areas you have a particular triplet of colors that are present. So you see this interesting emergence of large-scale behavior in the simulation. Now, we can again look at uh, the geometry of these spirals. So again, I have applied here a different uh, color scheme which focuses on uh, zones where there's a transition between one color and another one and you'll see again these uh, spirals appearing and if you look closely at them you see that these are all spirals with three arms. Now we can also look at an asymmetric case. So what I chose here is a value of a, which is constant, equal to 0 0.75, but b is decreasing in the course of time. So right now it's about 0 0.6, and it, uh, it keeps decreasing. So the evolution starts in the same way as before, with uh, three armed spirals everywhere. But we are going to see that as b decreases, at some points, things will start to change. So, okay, right now you see that the spirals are not as nice anymore, so they tend to, to disorganize, so the whole evolution is becoming more chaotic. And now I get larger patches of colors. And Let's wait a little bit for B to decrease even more. At some point, you will see that 
Yes, here you see that suddenly my spirals have become spirals with five arms. So now at every point around which the spirals rotate, there are five instead of three colors meeting. So we can again uh, look at this with a different color scheme that uh, highlights the transitions between different colors. So at the beginning, we have these structures with spirals that have three arms. So if I go a little bit further, I still have these uh, spirals, but now they slowly tend to disorganize. I tend to lose this uh, spiral shape. So the picture becomes a bit more chaotic. And as the parameter B decreases further, at some point we are going to see these five-armed spirals appearing. So we are almost there. So you start seeing very faint new uh, interfaces appearing. And now we have reached the situation with five armed spirals. All right, so there's one last uh, example of reaction diffusion equations I wanted to talk about, and that comes from neuroscience. So just a quick uh, overview of some facts in neuroscience. So here you have a cartoon of a neuron, so a nerve cell. It has a body called the soma and many uh, extremities. So the smaller ones are called dendrites and there's one long extremity called the axon. So the dendrites uh, actually tend to carry to, to uh, get information from neighboring neurons and the axon will send information to other neurons. And one particular thing that you can do and uh, that has been done in experiments is to measure the electric potential across the membrane of the axon. That's called an action potential and it tends to have this kind of behavior here with small oscillations and big oscillations called spikes. So a spike is a temporary peak in the action potential. And these spikes travel along the axon and in this way transmit information. Now it, it is understood that uh, one of the effects, one of the principles that creates these action potentials are ion channels, which are little openings in the membrane of uh, the axon that let ions, so charged uh, particles, cross the membrane. So in a way it works a little bit like an electrical circuit. And this has been modeled in uh, some detail. So uh, there's a so-called Hodgkin-Huxley model. Uh, so it uh, awarded uh, Hodgkin-Huxley the Nobel Prize in Medicine in 1963 shared with Sir John Carew Eccles. And uh, what they did is they built this model of a neuron uh, which compares it to an electrical circuit with elements like a capacitor here and some uh, sources and some resistances. So the idea is that uh, you have one resistance which uh, describes the uh, transmission of sodium ions, another one for potassium, and a third one for what is called the leakage of ions. And uh, the resi resistances here for sodium and potassium depend in a complicated way on the potential difference across the membrane. So this is a, gives rise to a set of differential equations, which are quite complicated, so you can analyze, analyze them, but it's, uh, it's very difficult. But there are uh, simplifications. So one simplification is the so-called Fitzhugh-Nagumo model, 
which is now a two-dimensional differential equation, which is given here. And in some particular cases for the parameters, it reduces to what is known as the Van der Poel oscillator, which goes back even further. So it was proposed by Balthasar Van der Poel in 1920 uh, to describe uh, certain vacuum tubes uh, which have these oscillations called relaxation oscillations. So the Fitzhugh-Nagumo model is a bit uh, richer, so because you have these parameters A, B, and I that you can change. So here the idea is that V is again the membrane potential and W is an auxiliary variable which is connected to the number of open ion channels. Now you can analyze this equation by a geometrical approach. So here I have plotted V on the abscissa, W on the ordinate, and I've color coded regions depending on the sign of the right hand size. So for instance, in the blue region, both V and W decrease. In the red region, V uh, decreases, W increases, and so on. And so you can use this to see that trajectories will have a tendency to turn counterclockwise here in, in the plane. But then things depend a lot on where uh, this vertical line, so here I've taken B equal to zero, so this vertical line is given by V equals minus A, where it is located corresponding to this cubic curve, which is the curve v minus one third v to the three minus w equals zero. And you can actually show that there are two possibilities. So one possibility is that you have a damped oscillation. So you will have maybe a spike, but then your neuron, your action potential will go to rest. And there's another situation where you have relaxation oscillations, like for the Van der Poel oscillator. So big oscillations with a slow decrease, then a large decrease, slow increase, large increase, and you cycle like that. However, you can't have both. So the idea in the deterministic model is to say, if you are in a situation with damped oscillations, but then you add some, some exterior perturbations, then these perturbations can make your system go from the rest state to a big cycle. And so you get these uh, spikes. And one way of doing this is to add noise to the system. So my last example for today is now a uh, a variant of the system. So now I have a reaction diffusion equation. So I have added the Laplacian here and it's two dimensional. So it doesn't really describe what happens along an axon, but one can imagine that this is a model for a large collection of neurons. And you see a first thing happening here. I started in the, in the rest state but due to noise, I have uh, what I call, uh, what is known as excitability. So I have these uh, spiking neurons that appear in white that uh, at the beginning spike in a somewhat random way, but then they tend to organize in patterns. So by the way, when all neurons spike in sync, as we've seen a little bit at the beginning, that is believed to be associated with epileptic seizures. So that is something you want to avoid. But as you see, after a while, uh, these big oscillations disappear in favor of a more interesting pattern, which is again a spiral pattern, which is similar to what we have seen in uh, the rock, paper, scissors and similar equations. So these spirals uh, slowly grow and after a while they tend to invade the whole space. Now the 
behavior depends a lot on these parameters, which I've called A1 and A2 here. So if you change these parameters, you can easily get a situation which is much more like a synchronization, like a seizure, or a situation where uh, the uh, neurons are almost all at rest with very little spiking. So somehow the idea is that the most interesting behavior, maybe the behavior of the brain of a person watching this video, is this kind of uh, nice, almost periodic uh, behavior with these uh, spirals propagating against my sample. All right, so that is all for today. So you have links in the description with uh, the different uh, videos I've shown here. So you can watch them uh, on my channel. So in another video, I will say how instead of simulating the heat or uh, so uh, reaction diffusion equations, you simulate the wave equation. So that's it for today.